Happy Monday, everybody. Joining us today for Mixing a Water Monday is former Gamecock wide receiver Tori Gurley. Tori, I know we had a chance to talk about the game a little bit before we hopped on, but now that you've had, what, a couple days to let it kind of just sip, settle on in, what's just your thoughts on what we saw on Saturday night? It hurts even worse, <laughs> you know, just sitting here thinking about it. Um, we had a great opportunity to close out a game at home, and that's something that you want to do. You want to you want to take care of home field advantage, and for us to um, find a way to to give it away, it just it hurts. Um, the, the fan base was super excited. We're coming off a of bye week, and we just knew like the way the game started with us being able to move the ball offensively. You know, we were on pace to you know put up big numbers, but unfortunately, our defense wasn't on the same page and couldn't get the stops when we needed them. And, and, you know, careless turnovers is the reason why we, you know, we're in this position where we end up losing a game that we were supposed to win. Let's talk about the offense for a minute, because there's been plenty to talk about with the defense. We will talk about the defense. No one's trying to sugarcoat stuff. It stunk the other night. Okay. It stunk. You want someone not sugarcoating it? There you go. It stunk. But let's talk about the offense coming off the bye week. There was a lot of good things I felt like they did. They moved around the offensive line a little bit. You had guys in different spots. What are you noticing about this offense in terms of what they're doing that's different from last year? Obviously, you have a new play call. call or we all know that. But what are you liking about what they're doing? Is it the spacing? Is it just trying to allow Spencer to you know, make things happen with his abilities and not kind of putting him in a box, which it felt like at times last year? Yeah, it's just a testament of his growth as a player. Um, you know, his leadership ability, um, the way Spencer can disperse the ball around his teammates and just having, you know, weapons on the perimeter. You know, when Xavier Leggett, he's out there making plays. Um, you know, you, you got a cast of guys that's able to get it done for you and that spacing and and what these guys do after the catch. I think that's the biggest thing, too, is, you know, you have explosive plays. Sometimes you have your, your 30-yard bombs downfield, but – other times, man, they're throwing slants or screens or whatever, and you're watching these guys, you know, get busy after the catch, and that that shows that these guys are playmakers on a perimeter. You mentioned Xavier Leggett as someone that had the opportunity to play at the next level. What are you noticing that he's doing that will allow him not just to play at that next level but to be good and hopefully great one day in the NFL? Right now, it's confidence. Um, you know, his story is unique. And now this is his opportunity to be the guy with the injury to Juice Wells. And he's showing that he can, any ball that's in the air in his air, in his radius, he's going to find a way to come down with it. Um, so that's very impressive. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the biggest thing is he's hard to get on the ground. You know, it <laughs> takes more than one defender to get him on the ground. Yards after the catch, you know, it, it almost reminds me, <laughs> Excuse me. It always it, it reminds me of a Debo Samuel, you know, how he's so explosive with the ball in his hands. And, you know, what he does, man, is just is extremely, you know, phenomenal where he can turn a, a literally a screen pattern into like a 90 yard touchdown. So whenever you have someone that's always a home run threat, you know, that's where it opens up the offense and creates lanes for other people to make plays. If you were advising Juice Wells, and obviously he's a big boy, he's going to make his own decisions, depending on obviously multiple factors, right? How this season goes, how the foot's feeling, right? In the process of trying to get back out there, he has the opportunity to come back next year regardless, regardless if it's a medical red shirt or not. He could still come back because he does have an extra year of eligibility because of the COVID season. Again, as someone that has played at that next level, he's not dumb. He's seeing his draft stock drop just because he hasn't been able to play out there this season, what would you tell him? What would you advise him, you think? You think, hey, be back next year. You know, obviously you don't know the quarterback situation. You could have a younger guy out there like Lenore Sellers because Rattler's time is going to be up. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's something that, you know, he, obviously he has to make that decision. But if I was in his camp, I definitely would lean towards uh, Juice coming back and just being a leader and, and building rapport with everybody else on his team. Um, you know, as as someone that is regarded as being a potential draft pick, everybody on the roster looks at Juice as a leader, no matter, you know, if he sees himself that way or not. So just him being in the building, uh, doing all the right things and and and, and preparing guys for what they're going to do moving forward could be a huge boost to 
to Carolina's football team. You know, it, it definitely will help them in recruiting, but it'll definitely pay off dividends where, you know, if he does come back the following year, you know, him building that rapport with his teammates, if it's Lenora Sellers, um, you know, if it's Dante Reno or whoever at quarterback, you know, when they feel like, hey, man, I got a security blanket and juice. And now, once again, we're able to have – at South Carolina, we always pride ourselves on having, you know, DBs and wide receivers. And when mm-hmm. you know you have a stud out there on that perimeter that's the X or the Z, it just – it literally opens up the field for everyone else. And that was something I was able to benefit from. You know, I got to play with Alshon Jeffrey. Alshon had all the coverage. And despite having two or three people on him, the guy still could make plays, but it left one-on-one for me in the slot on the opposite side of the field. And that's something that juice could do. And it, it really could help out, you know, you know, the OC and it can help out, you know, whoever is going to be a quarterback next year. So, um, you know, that's, that's one of the positives of coming back to school. Um, but if he decided to come out and join the NFL, he understands what he's at, you know, what he's putting at risk where, okay, he might be coming in and he's, he's not healthy. He's going to have to get himself prepared for the combine or whatever all-star game he's going to play in. And he knows, you know, if he doesn't go out there and handle business, his you know draft stock ultimately could fall because, mm-hmm. you know, he's he's looked at his damaged goods. So this is something where he and his family and, and Coach Beamer have to weigh out the pros and cons. And I, I'm hoping he stays because I feel like he could be a potential, you know, day two pick or, mm-hmm. or potential first round pick um, because he, he can he can put up that type of production. Yeah, no question about it. Would be awesome to see a healthy Juice Wells on one side and healthy Xavier again on the other. We'll see if that happens this season or not. All right, kind of like that root canal that we were talking about beforehand. Let's just get it over with. Let's talk about the defense. That was bad. I mean, that was really bad. Um, I think the thing that stood out to me, Tori, and I just want your initial thoughts just on the defense as a whole, and then we'll get deeper into it. When you needed them to get stops, they couldn't. You know, Florida came into that game as a team ranked towards the bottom in third down conversion rate. Um, That was around 50 percent, but you couldn't get off the field on fourth downs. I mean, there's obviously a critical fourth down conversion that Florida was able to pick up towards the end of the game, which eventually led to the game winning touchdown. That's what stood out to me, just not being able to get off the field when you needed that defense to the most. Is that something that stood out to you or is there something else to it? Absolutely. And um, that's something that being at home and having William Bryce as you're you know, having the fans there, we're supposed to be able to capitalize on that. You know, Florida is supposed to have false starts or, you know, the, they're supposed to allow the defense to just get after them to where, you know, we're putting them in a bond to, to turn the ball over. And it's like we couldn't get off the field. And, you know, and the fans started to get restless. You know, we, we kept getting ourselves up and, you know, obviously, you know, Mike and Mike, you and I, we sit up in the box and, you know, we have to watch the game and we're not allowed to cheer because we're scouting it or reporting on it. But just seeing the the body language of the fans, they started to get restless because it felt like we just couldn't get the stops when we needed them most. And it, it, it hurts. You know, it's one of those things that it doesn't get any easier, especially when you have to go on the road, because now, you know, we got to go against their fan base. And, you know, that's what's something we pride ourselves on is, you know, getting false starts and stuff like that. And that comes from, you know, from the fans. And with our defense, guys not, you know, getting penetration or not getting sacks. Uh, obviously, we're super young in the secondary. I mean, we got so many young yeah. guys back there. You know, they're still trying to figure it out. But you would think, you know, coach, you know, would be able to dial up something where we can get some pressure and get guys on the ground. Uh, again, I, I obviously you play the offensive side of the ball, but you get football. I mean, shoot, I'm sure back during your, your high school days, you played a little defense. You understand what defense is about. Naturally, and you get this, when the offense isn't clicking, when the defense isn't clicking, naturally fans are going to say, hey, you know, we got to move on from a coordinator, okay? As you know right now, and I don't know if you t- totally agree with me, Tori, at some point, yeah, you can have those conversations. I think right now it's a bigger picture than that. I think – the bigger problem is guys just aren't executing. I mean, you tell me fourth and 10, fourth and 11, I don't care who your defensive coordinator is. I don't care who your head coach is. You have to be able to get off the field. So I bring that up, Tori, because as you travel to Missouri, a Missouri team that's playing very good football, very good football, and you have to find a way to win this weekend or else this season could go south quickly, and it already is. You need to find a way to stop this. From a defensive standpoint, 
what do you think's going on in that building? You know, Sunday, Monday, I know Monday's more of a, an off day, but what do you think's going on as they get ready for this week against the Tigers, trying to find something kind of like that flex seal patch to just patch up the hole? Cause you're not going to be able to do a complete, you know, uh, 180 change on this defense overnight. Yeah, I, I think it's the biggest thing, and it's cliche, but it's really going to be execution. You know, I, I believe in those guys. Obviously, I was a big advocate for Coach Beamer and, you know, and with the support staff he brought in. Um, I think those young men need to be challenged on stepping up when when people need them. You know, I, I doubt that we're calling the wrong defense. You know, I, I think it comes down to individuals winning their one-on-one matchups and when the play needs to be made, go make it. Um, but unfortunately, if those guys don't do that, then, you know, heads are going to roll. So, um, you know, it's definitely – I would challenge the guys to go out there and go get it done because what they're failing to realize is if they don't do it, I'm quite sure Coach Beamer and, and the staff is telling, you know, kids who they're recruiting, hey, you can come here and play right now because we can't get off the field on fourth and ten. So – um, that's the beautiful thing about sports is, you know, you constantly have to update your resume. And if you don't do it, somebody else will. So I'm hoping those guys would, you know, take individual pride in going out there and making that play because that can be the difference between, you know, you being in the building or or somebody else being in the building. And, and it's as simple as that. It's kind of timely you brought that up because just yesterday, South Carolina was able to complete the flip of a four-star defensive back, four-star athlete. He's coming in to play corner to Lewis Solomon after originally committed to Auburn. So there you go. Lewis is probably looking at the situation, saying it the exact way that you're <laughs> saying, like, man, they could use some some help in the secondary. They could use a guy that can be able to lock down someone. And like you said, when you're one-on-one. Last thing I want to ask you, Tori. you have a game like this against Missouri. You're coming off the type of loss that you had you know people are going to be saying stuff about your positional coach. And let's not sugarcoat it's Clayton White. Uh, I've been a big fan of Clayton, and I still feel like, you know, he can do some good things here. Defense has not been there in comparison to where it was in the first year, and it's kind of took a step back in different areas since then. Um, you're, You're ranked last in the SEC when it comes to pass defense, and you're ranked towards the bottom of the country in that. When you know on the outside people are talking about your coach, Especially now, because as you know, everyone has one of these. It's hard to ignore it completely. Or someone saying, hey, it could be a friend, could be a cousin. Hey, you hear what they're saying about your coach. How can you use that as motivation instead of it letting it, you know, deteriorate you? Because obviously these these guys are, you know, 18, 19 years old. Some of them obviously are, you know, in their 20s and a little bit older. But how can you use that as motivation? Because as, as you said, you know, this is a big boy business. If results don't happen at some point heads might have to roll how do you how do you do your job though as a player to make sure that doesn't happen well i I can just throw this out here if if you love your defensive coordinator and your position coaches you got to go out there and perform and and make them right because if not as we mentioned earlier it's a big boy business and you know people are going to make different decisions based on results and if those results are not there there's going to be somebody else as your defensive coordinator and as your DB coach or linebacker coach or whoever. And that's when we get into this, um, you know, wild business of sport where when they bring in a new person and if you're not one of their guys, they're going to push you out of the door. So, you know, if you want that continuity where this guy, this guy that recruited you brought you in and he's developing you, you know, as a defense, you got to step up and, and, and show up for the, for the staff, because if not, that's just the, you know, that's just the bottom line business. It's all about results. It's about wins, you know, and whenever you have more losses than wins, then, you know, hey, you know, they got to move on and we got to find people that can put South Carolina back in position to, to you know, be, to be bowl eligible or whatever else. So, um, you know, like I said, it's going to be a challenge to those guys in the locker room, everyone, but especially on the defensive side where you go out and, and you get it done for your coach. I appreciate it, Tori, you hopping on today. You mentioned scouting. I know we were talking about the other night, but just to let people know what you've been up to because they hear like, what, Tori's doing some scouting? Yeah, so I, I'm a scout for the East-West Shrine game. Um, you know, I love it. You know, it keeps me around. Obviously, you know, people see me on the sideline and, you know, they're like, oh, man, you know, they're, 
they don't understand I'm there, at, you know, at a working capacity. But I just love being able to to help players and and you know give them draft grades and and watch guys develop to to achieve their dreams. I mean, just last year, you know, guys like Zach Pickens or Darius Rush, you know, they came down, played an All Star game, end up getting drafted, and you know, those things are just they mean a lot to me because when I went through this process, you know, 15 plus years ago. I didn't understand how the business works. So to be mm-hmm. able to be, you know, a, 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 a sounding board for these players or their parents or coaching staff or whoever, you know, I can keep it real with them and, and let them know how this business really works. So, you know, I love scouting. Like I said, it just keeps me around the game and, you know, I get to watch football and get paid. Can't beat that, man. Yes, sir. Can't beat that. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully if, if you're watching that football and you're watching it, whether you're covering the team, whether it's your alma mater, even though there's no cheering in the press box, like you said, hopefully there's more wins than losses because it makes the job a hell of a lot easier. That's for sure. Tori Gurley, appreciate you hopping on today. I'm mixing a water Monday. Yes, sir, man. Thanks for having me.